This program was brought to you by Kola Institute of Venture at Tel Aviv University. This is the show me the money part of the show and um, maybe we can start with Barak and you could just say very quickly what your background is. Hi everybody. Uh, I was for a long time in the military. I was commander of the innovation commando in the army and now I invest in startups and involved in many philanthropic initiative to build in Israel an ecosystem for innovation. So, so you represent Winnovation. Hello everyone, my name is Steve Schachter. I'm a professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School and the chief academic officer for a consortium in Boston Cambridge called CIMIT, this, which stands now for the Consortia for Improving Medicine through Innovation and Technology, which is a, a organization that finds, funds, and facilitates uh, collaborations between engineers, scientists, and physicians to improve patient care. I'm still Sophie Manigar. I did not introduce myself uh, previous time. So I'm a professor at the uh, Vlerik Business School and Ghent University, and I'm researching uh, entrepreneurial finance, uh, both from the supply side and the demand side. But I'm also uh, involved in uh, real life initiatives. I'm uh, part of the investment committee of the spin-off fund of our university. Um, I'm involved with GIMF, which is uh, private equity, the largest Belgian private equity investor. Well, what's the market cap of GIMF? Uh, Two billion euros. And uh, I'm also um, founder and still board member of a business angel network in our region. Hi. My name is Simone Botti. No, I'll do with the mic. And uh, I uh, manage the MS Ventures Bio Incubator here in Israel and the MS Ventures Fund. MS Ventures is the corporate venture arm of Merck Serono, uh, Merck uh, um, a pharmaceutical company that dates back to the 1700s. And we have a long history of investment in early stage here in Israel. Um, besides Teva, we were the ones that also invested in. Uh, products in the Weizmann and we made it into a, a drug for multiple sclerosis called Rebif. In Israel, we invest in very early stage um, endeavors coming mainly from academia and from uh, entrepreneurs and we try to bridge the gap that we were talking about here. So maybe we can start with the first question. Uh, we're, we're, I guess we're talking about the valley of death here, which is, so question, which is a very open one. We, uh, how do you fan finance the very long-term investments? How, how do you get, how do you find the patient capital? Maybe we can start with Sophie. Okay, thank you. Well, I think that uh, currently we're facing quite uh, challenging times, uh, given that uh, major, broader patient investors in the past are challenged by public authorities basically as a problem um, faced up uh, with the financial crisis worldwide, in that uh, insurance companies, uh, banks, uh, that kind of investors face uh, more and more regulation and a type of regulation that is not compatible with that kind of long-term uh, risky investments that we're talking about. And this is a pity because uh, investors, institutional investors like pension funds, insurance companies, really have long-term horizons for their assets. So uh, they would be the perfect match to invest in long-term um, projects. But uh, especially for insurance companies, uh, the regulation becomes stricter and stricter. And um, so rather than stimulating that kind of investments, that will be uh, severely punished. Sophie, specifically, why aren't pension funds investing? Um, Uh, well, I wouldn't say they are not investing. Some do, and uh, some have a long history of having invested in that kind of project through venture capital mainly. Um, but uh, why don't they invest? If you look at the returns that venture capital, the, especially the early stage uh, venture capital has produced over the last 10 years, let's say, well, these returns are extremely low on average. So it's only the best funds that have produced a decent return that does not even 
or that barely compensates for the risk and the long-term nature of their investment that they take. And it's only a few very top venture capital firms that are always highlighted that really have realized very strong uh, returns and capital gains. But uh, it is a very difficult business to uh, make money in that compensates for the return. So we have also an issue at the return side. Maybe just uh, one comment about long-term uh, projects. Uh, I saw, I think that was the, the previous uh, slide here in the beginning of the day about what is deep innovation meaning. Uh, and I just want to emphasize is that not always if you wait for many years and you put a lot of money and you have something valuable, it means that it's deep innovation. Sometimes it means that you're a lucky guy that wastes a lot of time, okay? Deep innovation, when excuse me, I look at deep innovation, it means that there is something which look like, let's call it, super high tech. Because the normal high tech, information tech, whatever we are seeing now, is going to be commodity. And we need to think about what we saw today, neurotech and nanotech, and the combination of that, and fusing of that, and this is going to be very, very deep innovation. It, sometimes it will take some time. Okay, I, th I think, but very specifically for this audience, uh, the, the presentations we've seen, could you, um, so we've heard the different sources of um, translating IP, and there are issues in it. So people are asking, should they go to industry now? or should they go to angels or to crowdfunding? And a lot of that is to do with not just the capital, but um, um, you know, I think that there was an underlying fear as well of being cut out, you know, as a lot of inventors are. You know, so it would be great to go to Merck and, and have funding for them, but, but uh, is, will the inventor just be cut out of it, for instance? Yeah, no, we'll do, we'll, we'll do that because there's some people here that would like funding from it. But, but if, if it's not going to be stolen from them type of thing, however strong the IP is. Okay, so um, what I'm going to say applies mainly to the pharma industry. And it applies to the fact that you might be somebody researching something that you think is very valuable in a lab, in a garage. Uh, and you know that it's going to take a decade to reach the final user. Uh, and um, you know that you're going to be encountering a gap. And you know that uh, the more time and the more money is going to be invested, the less amount or the, less, the lesser the stake you're going to come out with it. In the end, monetarily, or at least this is the perception that you have. Now, first of all, this is a marathon, it's a long-term dance, and uh, the value of your idea and the value of the money and of the thousands of people that are put to work to actually bring that idea to millions of people needs to be put on the scale. And so the first thing is build your story so that it can be told to a number of audiences and so that those audiences help you to bring the gap to the point where you're ready to take your audience to a venture capital or to a pharma company like us. We invest at very, very, very early stages. We have made investments in the incubator with Tel Aviv University in companies that were based on the great name of three scientists and one nature paper. We've also made investments in the venture capital in, in assets that we licensed that were in phase two and human, the prices are completely different because the amount of effort that comes into play and the values are different. But at both, in both of these success stories, the story was told appropriately and it was at the right time. So if you're working on your dream research, understand that before you bring it to industry, there might be other people interested in your story that might help you increase your stake or not dilute your stake before you bring it to us. Like, for example, family offices that are interested because they have not only a monetary interest, but also a personal interest in a disease that you might be looking at, a foundation. It might be uh, crowdfunding. It might be patient groups. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, this is not necessarily 
the, uh, the VC's job, even if we, we actually do that, because many times you understand that something that is interesting is going to be better for us if it's cooked more. So what we do is we can help you and we can tell you, you know, Michael J. Fox has a three-year grant for this. And you know what? We have actually taken projects from the Michael J. Fox Foundation. This is an example. We have it. Um, so what we will do is we might help you to be put in contact with the right foundations because as a pharma company, we actually do have, as stakeholders, we might have overlaps. Or you might have a very good technology transfer office in your university that knows where to go for non-dilutive funding. They might have connections to donors. They might have connections to grant giving agencies that are based on making that translational step. And another thing is try to learn what are the rules of the game of making a deal with a venture capital. Come with a level of expectations that is real. The market is very well planned out. You can talk to your peers. You will understand what they have taken, what they have done, how long did it take to negotiate, and what you can expect and come with a laundry list of reasonable expectations. So what you're saying is revolution starts with language, as yeah. someone said, and talk about the story. Yes, talk about the story, and make sure that you tell the story to the right audience with the right color. Your story changes according to the level of development of your project. At the very early stage, your story is for dreamers. And dreamers might be philanthropists, might be grant-giving agencies, might be your families, friends, and fools. Next level, they might want to see a little bit more meat into it. And you will have to change your story and bring in the right amount of data. And later on, the people that follow you in your story will multiply your value and also your, your strength to bring in that patient capital that you need. Are there any questions from the audience? Just put your hands up. Please. Steve. Thanks. I just might add that in the US now, <clears throat> the government is increasingly a source of money for later stage projects, pre-commercialization, but later stage. And I think this is uh, particularly true for the Defense Department and also the NIH. Uh, with regard to the NIH Congress in the US, has asked the question, you know, with all the investment made in the NIH, you know, name me one therapy that has benefited patients. So they've encouraged the NIH to continue their. What's the answer? I don't want to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's not that's not been the purpose, uh, the overriding mission of the NIH to this point. It's been more the base, you know, discovery of new knowledge, basic science. But with Congress's influence and uh, insistence, they developed something called NCAI, the National Center for Accelerated Innovation, I think it is. And the National Heart, Lung, Blood Institute is the first institute to issue grants where the purpose is not to um, add knowledge, but rather translate existing knowledge into, in this case, drugs, devices, and diagnostics for heart, lung, blood, and sleep disorders, where there's a um, a likelihood within a year or two it could be commercializable. And uh, other institutes are likely to follow suit. The Defense Department, likewise, is not interested in new knowledge. They want here and now, you know, help for diagnosing and treating uh, their wounded soldiers. Um, so uh, some of these funds are open internationally as well. And uh, uh, it's an opportunity to, in a non-dilutive way to move project forward, adding value to it before it is commercialized out. Could, could I, I mean, I thought it was particularly attractive, um, the discussion on crowdfunding. I mean, I know because, uh, you know, the osteoarthritis, I've got a bad knee for two years, I, and, and I'm a crowd. And, I, um, and, you know, and funding it and being potentially part of a trial for it would actually be very attractive. And I wondered if the panel could, uh, Sophie, could discuss those points. I also very much like that idea because it will go 
it's uh, potentially going to revolutionize the way uh, the early stages of that kind of projects are financed. But I don't think that uh, crowdfunding is applicable to all kinds of projects. We have had two different streams of projects today, one more medical related, and there indeed you have a crowd. Uh, people can relate to Alzheimer. Everyone knows someone who has Alzheimer, and so they might be willing to donate. But uh, when thinking about the project that we were discussing, uh, well, this will be much more difficult because this, um, that was on, help me again, uh, the, na the nanowires, try to explain that to the crowd. So uh, for that kind of project, <laughs> it will be much, much, much more difficult, almost impossible to uh, explain why it's important, why it's interesting, why it's relevant. So I don't believe that for that kind of really technology projects, where it's very difficult to understand what the end product will be and what, why it is important to, to motivate the crowd. So, the, you know, so a, a number of the were, were stories well told where crowds would have, have um, uh, would find relevance for them, and um, is are there any crowd funding uh, sites for things like osteo uh, for 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 relevant medical? Yeah, we have just started with uh, Indiegogo as a crowd funding source of money for an epilepsy project in the US. And we're looking into a new entity which is not yet launched called Polywog, which was started by a former Pfizer executive and a colleague, a um, co-investor, um, which is going to be an investment vehicle um, taking advantage of, of new uh, investment regulations in the US allowing investors to be qualified for much lower um, you know, net worths and so forth. And so we're anxious. Maybe about talking about crowdfunding, um, I think that the ecosystem of deep innovation, it's a quite small in every place. If we are talking really about deep innovation, I mean, it's nanoscale ecosystem and the structure look like neuro, okay? <laughs> Very connected. Uh, but crowdfunding is going to wider, enlarge this small ecosystem. And we're talking today about crowdfunding, but I think in a few years, we'll see crowd engaging, crowd uh, uh, supporting, and much more than just financing. Uh, this is not happened yet, but it's going to happen. Uh, and uh, uh, as we are saying, you know, setting up new ecosystem, new players will come. So we need to aim to the place that we are not there yet. So this is what's going to be the crowd. Awesome. I mean, crowdfunding as an internet platform might be innovative, but the fact that you're bringing people together, small, to actually fund something larger is not necessarily that innovative. It's been around since people started putting money into ships to go around and bring trade. So the, the interesting thing is, how can you make stories relevant to a very large crowd of people that are not connected to each other and they might be willing to risk or fund for something in return? Now here, the important thing is to understand that according to the different industries that you're trying to fund, if it's a consumer product, it's very straightforward, right? Kickstarter is you're going to get a piece of it before anybody else. For medical and biopharma, the ethical implications are very deep. You can most probably not permit and not promise to anybody that they're going to be first in line for an experimental treatment. That is never in this, in this regulatory environment going to happen. Also because that person might simply not fit the inclusion exclusion criteria. And you can simply not do that because you're going to screw up your clinical trial. And the whole crowdfund effort is going to go down the drain. But I am, I am, I think that if you are able to tune the stories right and give the incentives right, then you will be able to, to lift this as an additional source of, pay, of what you were calling patient capital. Because it, it might not be necessarily tied to a very hard metric of within seven years I want to get three times on my money. 
It might be in seven years I want to be the, the person number three that actually saw this on Indiegogo, and my name is there in the roster of the first founders. So if the incentives are put right, that might actually be one of, one of the most powerful lifts uh, as far as uh, patient capital is concerned. Okay, so th that brings us to a, another point, which is, um, you know, tech push or medical pull. And, um, you know, what's the optimal approach for identifying a medical solution to a medical need? Maybe Steve. Yeah. Well, um, it's, this is an opinion, but this it comes out of our experience in Boston with this organization I mentioned, CIMIT, where since 1998 we've funded uh, about six or 700 projects um, with about... A, The CIMIT model, uh, again, it's a consortium, Harvard, MIT, uh, Boston University, Northeastern University, the uh, Veterans Administration, which is the uh, medical care system for veterans, military veterans, uh, all belong to this organization. The CEOs of each of these institutions, many of the Harvard teaching hospitals, are the governing board of CIMIT. Um, they contribute to the day-to-day -day operations through membership fees. Our prim primary source of money that we give out in grants is from the government. And over 16 years, we've given out over $100 million um, in uh, funding. Typically, it's around 100000 as a proof of concept and then up to half a million for proof of value and, and uh, pre-commercialization. But the, um, our experience over all this time Tapping into the engineering resources at Harvard and MIT and Draper Laboratory and now Northeastern and BU. And then tapping into the medical expertise at all the Harvard teaching hospitals, BU Medical Center. The, our, our lesson learned is that the most successful projects are those that begin with the focusing on what is the unmet need. Not focusing on the technology looking for a medical home, but what's the problem you're trying to solve? And, to medically, and who better to answer that question than the physicians taking care of patients with that problem and the patients themselves? Because they have the best idea what the problem is and what a viable solution might be. And then our job is to help them articulate that, begin the storytelling right then and there, and then match them up with the right technology, the right engineering approach. Um, and not only the right engineering approach, but the right person, the right team, because this is in our view, best accomplished by a day-to-day -day collaboration uh, rather than a handoff of specifications that the doctor wants to see. And for this day-to-day -day collaboration to be successful, it means um, um, uh, catalyzing rela uh, teams in which the individuals have the bandwidth, the passion, and the right personal personality types to um, stay focused on a project. And who are also willing, as the project matures, to work with our entrepreneurs and residents, which is our way of bridging the gap and providing a nexus. These, uh, we call it our accelerator team. These are med tech executives who work for us that become virtual CEOs of a virtual startup, even though it still is owned by um, the institutions, to, to mature the project further, to make it more attractive to outside investors and, again, to help de-risk it from a regulatory and, you know, a commercialization point of view. So uh, our advice when we're working with other ecosystems who want to um, develop similar collaborative multi-institutional efforts is to um, begin with the medical push. And we've done this in Singapore now, in Manchester, UK, and so forth. And, there are exceptions to the rule. There are the, you know, technologies that do uh, have a logical, a very obvious medical application. But by and large, we start with the, the physician, the patient, the unmet medical need, and let that be the driver, you know, um, and the starting point. So, um, you know, a lot of what you're what seems to be talked about today is, you know, whether to go for university funding or VC funding. And, but, but 
a big issue seems to be time for each one. And Barack, maybe you could talk about how important time is. Yeah, um, <clears throat> maybe first of all, I think that uh, in the innovation era, we don't have the privilege not to have deep innovation, okay? Because everybody is going to be in more innovative. So we need to be more than just innovative. And that takes time. But there is no, in my eyes, no secret sauce how to do that. Uh, it's a tailor-made issue to each economy, to each context, and to each time frame. Uh, so um, uh, maybe uh, from my perspective, there are many, many good ideas and inventions that can work but not enough leaders, CEOs, that can take it in the right time to do the thing, to deliver. And I think that there is enough money also on the table. Uh, now, I'm, I'm not sure how, uh, it was very interesting to listen to what you just said about CEOs that helping, uh, like, uh, because in the beginning, the, C, the, the, the guy who run the stuff uh, for the er early, early stage, the storyteller, what you say, it's a, it's a one that needs to feel ownership and some kind of passion to do the right thing very, very fast. And, uh, later on, if you have a finance player that wants to accelerate the time, sometimes it's bad for the venture. Sometimes it's bad. So I think that we need to look for everything in the right context for the, for the time zone. I mean, we cannot have a... a uh, 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 pregnancy, it's nine months. You cannot sh uh, shrink it. Uh, I'm saying it because two weeks ago I got a new baby. Uh, but sometimes uh, we can start in the right direction. I mean, sometimes probably everybody knows that when you want to park the car and you don't start correct, you need to do it over again. So it, you lose two, three years. You cannot just debug it. Uh, so it's the issue of the beginning to go and then to reinvent yourself later on. So coming back to the question, uh, university or um, venture capital investors, uh, most projects will not really have a choice. Uh, it will depend on the riskiness, the technological risk, how far are they from the market. and. I'm not a specialist on the Israeli venture capital scene, but uh, I do know that it would be extremely challenging to get venture capital in Europe, um, so independent uh, venture capital in Europe for a really early stage um, initiatives where there is still a lot of technological risk and the only way to find funding there is to go through the university and through the university funds and through the university structures. Um, and then I must say that uh, if you are a scientist with a new idea and a new project, then you're lucky because you can turn to the university. But think about all those entrepreneurs who are not linked to a university. They even do not have a university to turn to. So where do they have to go? And there I think there's a real uh, role for the government. We have uh, already highlighted that. Uh, so definitely the government uh, should also care for those entrepreneurs that are uh, coming up with new ideas, new ventures, new projects that are not related to science centers or universities or, or whatever. They are even in a greater need, in my view, compared to university scientists. This program was brought to you by Collar Institute of Venture at Tel Aviv University.